Great. Good evening. Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. Tonight's event is IWP's 24th annual Pearl Harbor Day lecture in remembrance of Pearl Harbor. This evening, we'll be hearing from Dr. Dove Zakheim. Dr. Zakheim is Senior Advisor at the Center for Strategic International Studies and Senior Fellow at the CNA Corporation, a federally funded think tank. Previously, he was Senior Vice President of Booz Allen Hamilton, where he led the firm's support of US combatant commanders worldwide. From 2001 to April 2004, he was Under Secretary of Defense and Chief Financial Officer for the Department of Defense. And from 2002 to 2004, he was also DOD's coordinator of civilian, civilian programs in Afghanistan. He lectures widely and provides print, radio, and television commentary on national security policy issues domestically and internationally. He blogs on the Hill and the national interest. Dr. Zakheim, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I wanna open actually with an apology. I normally uh, don't speak, not even from notes or anything else, but I felt that a lecture like this one deserved uh, a lot of work. And I'm going to speak from a prepared text. And uh, again, I apologize for doing so, but I hope it'll still be worth your while. Um, this day next year will mark eight decades since the Japanese launched a successful surprise attack against the Pacific Fleet stationed at Pearl Harbor. And President Franklin Roosevelt uh, rightly described it in his December 8th speech to a joint just session of Congress saying, and I quote, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, end of quote. And so it, well, and so it has been. But the attack that killed 2,403 people, wounded 1,104, destroyed or damaged 188 planes, eight battleships, three light cruisers, three destroyers, and four other ships thereby, and thereby crippled the Pacific fleet offers lessons for the future of American security that still ring true so many years later. Surprise attacks rarely come as a complete surprise. When they succeed, it's often because of a lack of preparedness, poor decision-making, or no decisions taken at all. Before turning to the future, which after all is the subject of this talk, I'd like to underscore the assertion I just made with some of lessons from the past. Some took place in the years preceding that attack, some took place years afterwards. On June 22, 1941, Adolf Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa and thereby broke Germany's treaty with Stalin's Soviet Union. Three million German troops attacked the Soviet Union on a line from North Cape to the Baltic all the way down to the Black Sea. The Nazi forces, like those of Napoleon in the previous century, reached the gates of Moscow before exhaustion, poor logistics, and bad weather halted their advance. But it need not have gone that far had Deputy Prime Minister Andrei Vyshinsky heeded the warning that Britain's ambassador to Moscow, Sir Stafford Cripps, had passed on to him on April 11th, and the further warning that Winston Churchill sent to Stalin about a week later. Stalin's neglect of that warning and failure to make any strategic moves to blunt the German advance led to the near disaster that followed for the next two years. It's been argued that Stalin suspected that Britain was trying to draw the Soviets into a war they could avoid, especially as the British were suffering serious military re reverses in Southeast Europe. There may also have been another reason. Just over a year earlier, in March 1940, Stalin had signed a peace treaty with Finland bringing an end to what has been called the Winter War. Although the Finns had given the Soviets a bloody nose, it was clear by the time the treaty was signed that the Soviet forces had the upper hand. A recent book that's appeared in Finland argued that Stalin signed the treaty because he had received intelligence about an Anglo-French plan called Operation Pike that called for a joint attack on Soviet oil fields in Azerbaijan in order to disrupt Soviet fuel shipments to Germany. But even though the German forces found detailed France for Operation Pike after they'd successfully conquered France in May 1940, no such operation took place. 
Nevertheless, Stalin could only have been suspicious of British intentions, especially coming from Churchill, who was a known anti-communist. So Stalin didn't react until it was too late. That the Soviets had a difficult time defeating the much smaller Finnish army involved more than the fact that the Finns were fighting on their home turf. In 1937, just two years before the Soviets attacked Finland, Stalin had liquidated his top generals, notably the brilliant Marshal Mikhail Chukhashevsky, the reformer General Iona Yakir, and the Chief of Staff Alexander Yegorov. Their replacements simply did not know how to manage their forces effectively. In particular, Tukhashevsky, like the Nazi general Heinz Guderian, who later was very successful in France, understood that mass tanks enabled the offense to bl blast through opposition, what came to be known as the Blitzkrieg. But the Soviets employed tanks in Finland as if they were artillery pieces, with a single tank assigned to each infantry unit. The absence of good operational and tactical planning was therefore equally a major contributor to what should never have been a close call for the half million strong Soviet army. Ironically, it was only three years later that the Soviets, led by a new cadre of commanders, won the biggest tank battle in history, the Battle of Kursk in July and August of 1943. The French army employed tanks more effectively than the Soviets in 1939, but not that much more. Though the tanks compared well with their German counterparts, the battle doctrine employed by the French military was slow paced. Tanks were assigned for infantry support, very much like, in fact, they had been used in World War I. The French did not field separate tank divisions like the Nazi Panzerwaffe divisions, because, and because their tanks were integrated with infantry, the French were unable to respond quickly to German Blitzkrieg combined arms tactics. So not surprisingly, just as the Soviets initially misread operational advantages the tanks offered them, so did the French misread the power of combined operations employing armor and offensive airstrikes. The critical turning point in the 1940 Battle of France was German armored penetration of French forces, notably in the Battle of Sedan, combined with unprecedented air attacks by the Luftwaffe. Unlike the Soviets, the French were unable to overcome their adversaries and France fell in just over six weeks. Now there was one French brigadier general who did appreciate the potential of armored warfare. In 1934, he published a book entitled Vers l'Armée des Métiers, Toward a Professional Army, which proposed mechanization of the infantry with stress on an elite force of 100,000 men and 3,000 tanks that could drive around like cavalry. He published a second book four years later entitled La France et son armée, France and her army, repeating many of the same ideas. The French military high command thought little of him or of his writings, but two days after the Germans attacked in May 1940, he was given command of an armored division that scored one of France's very few battlefield successes before the country went down to defeat. Now Charles de Gaulle, the author of those two books, is remembered for leading the free French and later on for restoring that country's glory. But the fact that his ability to think outside the box jeopardized his prospects for promotion is an object lesson in the dangers of operational conservatism. Let me move to another example. To the weeks prior to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor also demonstrated the terrible consequences that could result from a poor res response to intelligence and poor strategic and operational planning. Two naval war games, one in 1932 and another in 1936, proved that Pearl Harbor was vulnerable to an attack. Still in all, the State Department urged Franklin Roosevelt to move the fleet from the East Coast to Hawaii to deter the Japanese, even though by doing so, it increased the fleet's vulnerability. And more immediately, on November 27, 1941, the Navy Department warned Admiral Husman Kimmel commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet that a Japanese attack was imminent. The War Department issued a similar warning to Gen Lieutenant General Walter Short, who was the commanding officer of um, Hawaii's apartment, uh, of the Army, excuse me, uh, Hawaii De Hawaiian Department the same day. Kimmel's only response was to send two carriers to Midway, but he did it not to protect them from an attack, but to prepare an offensive against the Japanese. And Short's reaction was no better, probably worse. He was fearing sabotage by the Japanese Americans living in Hawaii. And so he massed all his army aircraft together to better to protect them 
And by doing so, he created an easier target for Japanese warplanes. The successful Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was, was therefore a result not only of American misreading of intelligence, but of a combination of strategic and operational failures as well. Having spoken about those failures, let me turn now to the 1973 Yom Kippur War. In this case, there was an initial intelligence failure as the Israelis had developed a false sense of security regarding an Egyptian attack. President Anwar Sadat had expelled the Soviets from Egypt the year before, and his forces trained for an attack across the Suez Canal, but those stationed on the canal itself remained pretty much quiescent, and that's what led into Israeli intelligence to conclude that no attack was imminent. Also, Cairo mounted a disinformation campaign that led Israeli military leaders to conclude that the Egyptian military was poorly prepared and suffered from maintenance shortfalls. When Egypt began a series of exercises in September 1973, the Israelis dismissed them as just maneuvers and nothing more. There were intelligence warnings, there always are, uh, but these accurate warnings came from junior officers and they went unheeded, just like de Gaulle's ideas about tank warfare went unheeded. When the Egyptians attacked on Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement, even, and that's when many, even many secular Israelis attended synagogue and Israeli preparedness was at its lowest, the Israeli civilian leadership was caught completely by surprise that the attack was coordinated with Syria and plunged Israel into a two-front war underscored the seriousness of the threat to Israel's existence. Now, while the initial, initially successful Egyptian attack represented an intelligence failure, the Israel Defense Forces Chief of Staff, General David el had ordered a partial mobilization. And on October 5th, the day before the Egyptian attack, he did ask for, and he got, and he received permission to call for a full mobilization of Israel's reserves. But just to show how the Israelis still didn't really get it, on the morning of October 6th, six hours before the actual attack, El Azar asked for permission for a preemptive airstrike against the Egyptian forces, kind of like the airstrike that essentially broke the back of the Egyptians and the Syrians in the Six Day War in 1967. But Defense Minister Moshe Dayan, who was a war hero, and Prime Minister Golda Meir denied him permission. And that enabled the Egyptians to cross the Suez Canal successfully. And so what had become as an intelligence failure was compounded by leadership in action that almost led to total defeat. It was only days later when American supplies flowed to the forces, the Israeli forces in the field, that the Israelis were able to recross the canal, ultimately encircle the Egyptian Third Army and save the country itself. Now, my last case is that of 9-11. At the time, uh, I was Under Secretary of Defense. What happened at the World Trade Center, at the Pentagon, and in the Pennsylvania countryside was once again a result of poor intelligence. In this case, poor intelligence coordination and a failure on the part of the intelligence community to provide timely warning to White House decision makers. Lots of books written about that. And of course, the 9-11 Commission dealt with that in great depth. Several of the hijackers were known to be in the United States, but warnings of their whereabouts never went up the decision-making chain. As the then Attorney General John Ashcroft told the 9-11 Commission, and I'm quoting here, the single greatest structural cause for the September 11th problem was the wall that segregated or separated criminal investigators and intelligence agents, end of quote. As an outgrowth of the commission's findings and recommendations, the George W. Bush administration created both the Department of Homeland Security and the National Counterterrorism Center. Unfortunately, the NTC, T, NCTC uh, hasn't done so well recently, and I'll mention that again uh, shortly. As we look to the future, how can we apply the lessons of Pearl Harbor and the other cases that I've just described? In the first place, we have to ensure that we have an accurate sense of the magnitude of the threats that we might face and be certain that our intelligence estimates reach decision makers in timely fashion. The Israelis underestimated the nature of the threat they faced. Our own decision makers never received accurate and timely intelligence of a terrorist threat that some in the White House sense was really imminent. 
we've got a multiplicity of intelligence services. We must ensure that they all really do talk to each other. And as I briefly noted a moment ago, it's sad, but the NCTC has been severely under-resourced in the past few years. That's not a good sign for the future. We also need to ensure that all our intelligence capabilities, both human and technical, are adequately resourced and directed at those targets that most threaten our country. And when I mean human resources, I'm not just talking about the people in the intelligence community. They're critically important, of course, but also our diplomats who are equally valuable as sources of intentions and developments in unfriendly states. We talk about so-called whole of government. We talk the talk, but we rarely walk the walk. Our State Department, even more than the NCTC, is severely under-resourced, and it suffered from recent purges that have deprived of it some of its most capable diplomats. We have to restore state to its leading role as a vehicle of American soft power, behind which our hard military, and for that matter, economic and financial power, can stand ready if to act if called upon. Now, in planning for the use of our hard power against potential adversaries, first thing we have to do is take them seriously in a way, for example, that the Israelis did not take the Egyptians seriously. We have to do so, we do so with, re with respect to China, but that's primarily in the context of its activities in the East China Sea and the South China Sea. It's especially important that the new Biden administration also maintain the support for Taiwan that that island democracy has received over the past several years. There is more bipartisan congressional support for Taiwan than there's been for decades. In fact, I would argue that there's probably more support for Taiwan than there's been since the Taiwan Relations Act was passed in the 70s. But it's not at all clear where the Biden administration will stand on the Taiwan issue. I'm not criticizing them. I just don't know where they stand. If the new administration is serious about promoting democracy, as we're told they are, then Taiwan, a truly democratic state, is a good place to start. Our current posture vis-a-vis -vis Russia is that it's a near-term threat. Once again, I think we're making, we're making a serious underestimate of Russian capabilities. It's simply not good enough. And the reason I say that is that the Western weapon systems that Moscow has been developing under Vladimir Putin's leadership are going to operate for the next decades, not for the next five years or so. We've got to maintain our vigilance with respect to potential Russian predations in Southeast Europe and the Balkans and Russian penetration of the Middle East and, of course, the Baltic states. We also must approach any resuscitation of the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Program of Action, in other words, the Iran nuclear deal, with great care. Not so much because we shouldn't have an agreement. It's simply that Iran's conventional missile threat to its neighbors is far more real than its nuclear threat, and it has to be reined in. That's not going to be easy to do. And we have to maintain a sufficient deterrent to dissuade the Ayatollahs from expanding their already aggressive activities throughout the region. So by all means, we can see if we can come up with a nuclear deal, but we have to recognize that that's the beginning, not the end. If we are to preserve our military superiority over potential foes, we have to sharpen our focus on the relative advantages and disadvantages that we possess in relation to them. To that extent, we have to change our entire approach, I think, to wargaming. All too often, we either skew the results or ignore them entirely. We have to conduct our war games that realistically depict potential enemy strengths as well as their weaknesses. We have to game Iranian and indirect attacks on our interests. We have to game Russian gray zone operations with little green men. We have to game Chinese attacks on our infrastructure, including our banks and hospitals, as well as more conventional operations that we might face. We must not only game our latest advantages, advantages in both the realms of space and cyber, but game all aspects of our high-tech capabilities realistically. When will our new systems actually become operational? How capable can we expect them to be? All too often, we hype what we're about to do, and then we don't do it, 
And if we do do it, we do it far later and far more expensively than we thought we would do it. We also have programs that are so highly secretive that they're not gamed at all. And they aren't included in command post exercises or field training exercises. But if they're so secret and they're not made available to and understood by battlefield commanders until the day of battle, how certain can we be that those commanders will trust them, put their trust in systems that previously were totally unknown to them? We have to think about how we get around this dilemma. It's a crucial one. And as I say, it's not enough to game high-tech capabilities. We have to ensure we actually have them and deploy them in timely fashion. I think it's universally understood that our acquisition system remains far too unwieldy and our program managers are far too risk averse. We have to reform our personnel system to reward and promote only those who, like Charles de Gaulle, have demonstrated a willingness to experiment and take calculated risks, even if those experiments sometimes fail and the risks are to their careers. We have to ensure that our personnel benefit from continuous education in the realm of cutting edge high technology, either by attending courses in the best institutes of technology this, this nation can offer, or by spending some time in the commercial high tech sector, and I underline commercial high tech sector, or doing both. Doing so will go far toward breaking down the walls between government and the commercial high tech world of Silicon Valley, of Research Triangle, Austin and Boston and so on, because those walls remain much too high. And finally, we have to recognize something else. We don't face our enemies alone. We're very fortunate to have allies who not only have committed themselves to fighting alongside us, but actually have done so at the cost of lives and treasure in Afghanistan, in Iraq, the Sahel and elsewhere. I saw them in Afghanistan. I saw them in Iraq. These are the same young men and young women that we send out there. Their lives have been just as much at risk and their losses have affected their families and loved ones just as much as our losses have affected our people's families and loved ones. So if we're gonna work alongside allies, fight and die alongside allies, and they're prepared to do that and have done that, then we must ensure that our technology meshes with theirs, that our war games are truly coordinated with theirs, that our exercises demand as much from them as from ourselves, which unfortunately they don't often do. And we must expand our combined operational deployments, especially in places like the North Atlantic, the Baltic and the South China Sea, so to demonstrate to potential adversaries the strength and the resiliency of our relationships. And we must consider that a net assessment vis-a-vis -vis those adversaries should include economics and finance because they too are hard power and that hard power can be wielded in conjunction with our allies, both in Europe and in Asia. Our adversaries don't have the network of allies and partners that we do. That network represents a huge political, economic, financial, and military advantage, and we shouldn't exploit it to the fullest. And it's not clear to me that we always do. Why should we take all these steps? Well, potential adversaries can become real ones, and we can't afford to take initial body blows as the Soviets did in June 1941, or for that matter, in the winter of 1939, as we did six months later at Pearl Harbor, as the Israelis did in 1973. High technology has accelerated the pace of warfare to the point where victory or defeat can be determined even more quickly than the outcome of the 1967 Six-Day War. We cannot take chances with adversaries like China and Russia 